northern France. An English force, ragged and cut off, prepares to fight its way to safety. Blocking the way is the finest army medieval France has ever assembled. The French noblemen are confident of victory and feel nothing can stand against them. But this day in October 1415 will not be theirs. Six centuries later, experts are now examining what we really know about one of the most famous events of the Middle Ages, the Battle of Agincourt. The Agincourt is about bravery, but it's also about glory. Somewhere around here, there are thousands of the dead from the Battle of Agincourt. And find out how the day became the most terrible disaster the French nobility had ever known. They have no idea that they're actually fighting for their lives. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, you can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? This unlucky battle was fought between the villages of Azancourt and Rousseauville in the year of our Lord, 1415, on the day of St. Crispin and Crispinian. The battle on October the 25th, 1415, is perhaps the best known in English history. Agincourt, or Azancourt, was Henry V's great victory. It cemented the young king's reign and turned the tide of English fortunes in the Hundred Years' War against France. The story of Agincourt comes to us from several contemporary sources. Henry V had invaded France to recapture lands he believed were rightfully English. His army besieged the port of Arfleur, but many of his men were struck down by dysentery. With weakened troops and the winter approaching, Henry turned north and headed for the English base at Calais. A huge French army now massed to cut off the English withdrawal. Some claim that as many as 40 or even 60,000 knights and men-at-arms stood against Henry V's army of a fraction of this number perhaps just five or six thousand. The confident French knights advanced to what they assumed would be certain glory. Thousands of armored men charged forward across the narrow battlefield. Most of Henry's troops were archers, only lightly armored if at all. Yet they were experts with one of the deadliest weapons of the medieval era, the longbow. The English archers rained down volley after volley of arrows on the French knights who fell into panic and chaos in the mud, where, trapped and helpless, they were either killed or captured in large numbers. It was the stuff of legend and quickly formed the mythic fabric of an England with a newly emergent sense of nationhood. The Battle of Agincourt sums up what people perceive of the medieval period in terms of battles. It was supposed to be the classic one where the, the outnumbered few uh, managed to win and therefore it's, it's reached mythical proportions in terms of, you know, anything is possible. It was Henry V's victory, somehow winning through against all the odds.
I think Agincourt is possibly, in most people's minds, the most famous medieval battle, especially in England, because it's reached mythical status thanks to William Shakespeare. It's the archetypal, stereotypical battle. So there is the underdog, the English, that managed to win. And of course, the nasty French are, are seen off the battlefield. And of course, it suits the English frame of mind. This is, you know, anything is possible. And this is what happened in Agincourt in 1415. This is broadly the way Agincourt was viewed for many years, for centuries even. It wasn't until relatively recently that historians began looking into the real story. Professor Anne Curry is the world's leading expert on the documented sources relating to Agincourt. Her starting point was the size of the two armies present at the battle. The assumed view often taken is that the French had a huge army of tens of thousands of men, outnumbering the tiny English army. But few, if any, researchers had gone back to the existing records to verify this. Many of Henry V's army, famously, were archers, and began by looking for records of these men. The received wisdom was that we didn't know the names of the archers who were at the Battle of Agincourt. It was thought we knew the names of the men-at-arms because of what's known as the Agincourt Roll, which is an early 17th century transcript. I made it my mission to go to the National Archives to look at all of the original source materials. This was a paid army, so we had a lot of pay records in the Exchequer files, and made it my mission really to find out the names of the people on the campaign. The files revealed just how many men Henry V assembled for the campaign in France. England didn't have a standing army at this point. However, it had enough military activity to make it possible to be a professional soldier. For the Agincourt campaign, the army that set out to go uh, there, we know the names of at least 7,500 people of what was probably an army uh, over 11,000, perhaps nearly 12,000. Finding out exactly how many men were at the battle on the 25th of October 1415 is more difficult. Yet from Anne's work, it can be estimated that Henry's army possibly numbered around eight or 9,000, more than the smaller force of perhaps five or 6,000 suggested in the past. Also, it seems the French army was not quite as large as many have suggested. Looking at the French army is much more complicated than looking at the English army. We have some financial records, but we just don't have as, as, as much, because after all, the French are on the defensive and they would no doubt hope to have as many troops as they possibly uh, could raise, say from towns and things of that sort. But one very useful indication is the amount of money that they uh, were raising. We have one very important document where Charles VI ordered the raising of money to support an army of 9,000 men. That was going to be made up of 6,000 men-at-arms and 3,000 gens de tree. That could include longbowmen and uh, crossbowmen. You see immediately the reversal, if you like, of the English ratio. We've got two men-at-arms to every one archer effectively in the, the French army. So I believe that the idea was to have a 9,000 strong army. It would have added to that, so maybe we could get it up to about 12,000, but it's really hard to see how it could have, have been larger than that. These ideas of 40,000, 60,000 just are not credible in the light of French army sizes uh, in this period. But it would have been men-at-arms heavy, uh, and it would have been aristocratic but I think you've got to remember the English army was also aristocratic. There really isn't that much difference. We have this idea of the English army being full of Tommies, if you like, being a popular army, and the French army being sort of, you know, of hooray Henrys. In fact, they socially, they are quite similar to each other. In terms of equipment, they are very similar to each other. Uh, and also, the thing that people forget too is the French have had to move huge distances too. Everybody misses that out. It's as if they've already you know, flown into Agincourt. Remember, they also are moving long distances. They would be weary. They would be running out of food as well. In late October 1415, the two armies, more evenly matched than was previously thought, were engaged in a pursuit through Picardy in northern France. Henry needed to get his troops back to English-controlled territory. 
It does seem that Henry, after taking Harfleur, decides that he will withdraw to Calais. All of the sources seem to agree on that. Uh, I don't think he was battle-seeking. He thought it would take eight days to get from Harfleur to Calais. Of course, it took a lot longer because they didn't dare cross the Somme. Crossing the River Somme would take time and leave an army vulnerable. The English had to try and stay one step ahead. The French army is sort of shadowing them on the other bank and therefore it takes a long time before they, the English can get ahead and get across the river. So I think we've got to say here that he is trying to get away and the French are trying to, to hound him. He is scared at that point to engage with the French. Karen Watts of Britain's Royal Armouries has studied the French army of the early 15th century. The French have got a totally different attitude with regard to this oncoming battle that they know is going to happen. They think they're going to a party. They think they're going to a, a grand tournament. There has actually been a tournament only 15 years earlier, a few miles away, called the Tournament of saint Ingelvert, in which the English and the French, during a truce in the Hundred Years' War, jousted together. And in fact, the French commander of Agincourt was one of the great tournament leaders of this tournament of saint Ingelvert 15 years earlier. So the French think they've come to a wonderful tournament, dressed in their best armour, the latest gear. For many of the French nobility, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. They streamed toward Agincourt from all over northern France eager not to miss out on catching the fleeing English. The composition of the French army was different to the English. The French anticipated that the battle would be fought on foot between the men-at-arms on both sides, and they reckoned they had the advantage in having larger numbers of men-at-arms. The French, though, do have a plan to send a group of cavalry against the archers to override the, the archers. They're trying to eliminate Henry's advantage, which is that he could loose arrows against the advancing French and try to damage as many of them before they engage, to knock them out before they can get to the English lines. It seems that the French did not have as large a cavalry group against the archers as they'd intended because the knights and gentry wanted to be in the melee. They didn't, they, they didn't see any glory in riding down archers. They're expecting a glorious amount of hand-to-hand -hand combat with the opposing English army and above all hoping to have hand-to-hand -hand combat with the English nobility and above all the English king. But this was unlike any tournament the French noblemen had experienced. In less than an hour or two, they, the flower of French chivalry is decimated. This comes as an utter shock and a surprise. Their own brothers, their fathers are dying before them. Earls, dukes, counts are all falling. And at this point, they're still trying to pretend that they are noble and chivalrous. And you find a number of the high nobility offering their gauntlets a surrender because they're expecting to be captured. If they surrender, they'll be captured, they'll be ransomed, they'll be all right. They're in no great danger. They're not going to actually die, not if they, they give themselves up. These French knights have completely misjudged and misunderstood the battle in which they find themselves. They have no idea that they're actually fighting for their lives. With a high proportion of nobles fighting in the front lines of both armies, many of the French killed were aristocrats. This was unusual for a medieval battle. Most of the dying was usually done by common soldiers. This has a massive consequence for immediate French history because there are no heirs and France becomes massively weakened and decimated and unable to provide male heirs for, I would say, 50 to almost 100. It has an effect to almost a century later, this one battle. 
Anne Curry believes the numbers involved have been exaggerated. At the time of the battle, France was a nation divided by civil war between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs. Contemporary accounts from both sides vary in their estimates of the numbers killed, probably for political reasons. Agincourt was a disaster for one party of the French. There were quite a number of Burgundian deaths. It is extremely difficult to know the actual number that died, but I don't think numbers like 5,800, which is put in the Burgundian Chronicles, those seem just as exaggerated as the, uh, the numbers of, of, of troops. Maybe, you know, one and a half thousand would be a, a, a reasonable figure, even for the English as well. I mean, some English sources imply, you know, it's sort of 10 people, others about 400 or whatever. So th perhaps of all the things we, all the difficulties we have with figures, the, the dead is going to be the most difficult one to know. Whatever the exact number, it was a very heavy defeat for the French. King Henry himself claimed God must have been with the English that day to punish the French. Churches and cathedrals across England bear tomb effigies and memorials to the veterans of Agincourt. In France, there are relatively few. On the field itself, there are no memorials dating back to the time of the battle. To this day, no one knows exactly where in these fields the last resting place is of the many Frenchmen who died here. It's this very absence of graves that drew Tim Sutherland's attention. He's an archeologist and battlefield specialist. He's best known for his work at another medieval battlefield, Towton in Yorkshire, Northern England. Agincourt is a much more widely known and written about battle than Towton. So when he became involved here, Tim expected his research to be relatively straightforward. We're going into an environment where we think we know everything. It's a classic story, Shakespeare's covered it. Every historian of name who deals with military history has covered Agincourt. And so we went in there thinking it was gonna be a piece of cake. He had no idea that he'd embarked on an investigation that would last for more than a decade. At Towton, Tim oversaw the excavation of a mass grave following its accidental discovery. He knew such grave pits also had to exist here at Agincourt but before he could excavate them, he had to try to find them. In 2002, he and metal detector expert Simon Richardson carried out a major survey of the supposed battle area. They found and plotted a range of finds, but found almost nothing medieval, nor anything relating to 1415. Tim was frustrated, but he was hooked. In 2007, he and Simon returned. This time, the idea was to target the area around a calvary, or calvaire, near the center of the battlefield. From his research, Tim found that the 19th century monument commemorated a local family, but also that it happened to be on the site where many of the French dead from 1415 were traditionally thought to have been buried. When we first came here, we did some primary metal detecting surveys across the whole length of the battlefield, but also we targeted the area around the calvaire where we were now standing, primarily because we weren't initially allowed to do any archaeological work inside the, uh, the area of the enclosure at, at all. As part of the archaeological survey, the geophysical survey, we started to find lumps and bumps of geophysical anomalies, but just outside the calvary here, there was a very large metal anomaly buried quite deeply below the surface of the soil. And of course that means that we targeted as an area of potential excavation. The anomaly seemed to indicate a large amount of buried ferrous material. Tim had only found small artifacts and no armour at Towton, though he was fully aware of the mass graves at Visby in Gotland, where many men had been buried still wearing their armour. It was rare to find armour, but could it happen again here at Agincourt? Accounts suggest Henry V had some of the armour from the defeated French, buried or burned, to save it from the enemy. The problem was that we didn't know what this metal anomaly was. It was a huge ferrous 
blob on an archaeological geophysical survey. And it, was, it had to be investigated because we knew it was very deeply buried. And of course there are all sorts of rumours about uh, Henry V burying pits full of arms and arms that he'd collected from the French. So in the back of your mind you think, is this possibly it? It's a huge hole and it contains a large amount of ferrous or iron material. So of course we had to go and target it and excavate it. We finally excavated a large hole, deeper, deeper, it got down to about three feet deep and then we were metal detecting as we went and then just be beyond the depth of a spade this fer ferrous metal anomaly turned up on the metal detector. We thought this is it, whatever it is, it could be an unexploded bomb, it could be a buried tractor, it could be absolutely anything. And then we slowly uncovered it and it was a pipe from a drilling rig that was fractured off and was deeply buried right in the ground underneath our feet. And it didn't make any sense at all. A steel pipe maybe extending down for hundreds of feet, had created a huge ferrous signature. One, we were very deflated, and two, we didn't know what it was. And then, of course, we talked to the landowners, and then one of them came over and said, ah, I remember that in the 1960s, they were drilling here for oil, and nobody told us, and everybody had forgotten. And so that answered one of the questions about what the geophysical survey anomaly was. Then somehow, out of the disappointment, Came opportunity. Now that had a knock-on effect because everybody felt so sorry for us that, that, that finally the, the, the landowner allowed us to do some archaeological excavation inside the Calvary enclosure itself. It was too good a chance to miss and normally wouldn't have been possible. Tim knew that this site was chosen for the Calvary because it had previously been the site of a chapel which might have been built in commemoration of the 1415 graves. It was destroyed during the French Revolution, but Tim wondered if traces of it might still exist and possibly provide clues to the lost graves. In the height of summer, this is almost impenetrable. So the first thing we had to do is clear the whole enclosure. So we strimmed it all out and cut it all back. And then we started to do a geophysical survey Straight away they found evidence of war, but not of the kind they were expecting. Just below the surface, or sometimes lying on the surface, there was a series of metal artefacts. And some of them were First World War bullets, and some of them were Second World War bullets. And there were badges and coins and all sorts of things. And basically people have been using this enclosure for whatever reason over the last 50, 100 years through both the First and Second World Wars. So of course people have been coming to this enclosure and also visiting it because it's an archaeological site of interest. And it all focuses on this cross here. Investigating this area, trying to understand it, is very important in terms of what, how it fits into the landscape of the battle. The Calvaire had seen a lot of history, but so far none of it seemed to relate to 1415. Undaunted, they recorded the surface finds and began to dig. We started off by putting a large trench across the entranceway because when we first walked in here there was some stones evidence protruding above the ground and in that trench we found a series of stones and bricks with some lead casting in it which obviously held the railings and so it looked like it was an entranceway to something that had a, a metal gate in it. Subsequently we found a postcard that actually still shows a photograph of the gate in situ which was nice. We tried to date it and unfortunately it was built of the same bricks that the chapel would have been built of in the 18th century. And so we couldn't really date it. So finding that photograph was quite nice in that it looked more of a, a you know, 19th century gateway. And therefore they just used old build materials that were probably lying around the site. Encouraged by the 18th century remains, they kept digging, expecting at any moment to find the medieval graves. But again, it wasn't so simple. Every place we put a test bit within the enclosure here, we came down onto almost pure soil. And there was nothing in it, a few fragments of brick and very little else. There's certainly no archaeological evidence of human remains or large pits that ever contained human remains within this enclosure. Now that's very strange because everybody thought it did. And so we have this anomaly. Where are the French dead from Agincourt? 
Tim had to search for other evidence, other clues in the history of this area that might open up a new line of inquiry. It's then that he found that someone else had been there before him. All this time, he'd been walking in the footsteps of another archaeologist, and possibly the first ever battlefield archaeologist. In 1818, Lieutenant Colonel John Woodford was a British officer serving with the Army of Occupation following the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. With a lifelong interest in history, Woodford took the opportunity when stationed nearby to carry out his own investigations on the site of this famous battlefield. The only person we know who's archaeologically excavated in this area is John George Woodford. And that was in 1818, and he came along after the Battle of Waterloo with a troop of men, about 60 apparently, and he carried out some archaeological excavations, and he found mass graves. And in the mass graves were gold coins, there were arrowheads, fragments of iron that he described and that drew, and, uh, and obviously related to the Battle of Agincourt. And these were the dead from the Battle of Agincourt. Now, of course, what the problem is now is we don't know where he excavated. The excavation site has long since been lost. After all, hardly any record existed that it had ever taken place. The artefacts that Woodford found have, it seems, also been lost. In England, Tim follows the trail to find out more. No one before him has tried to put all these pieces together. At Warwickshire's county archive, he's found some vital clues. He's been drawn here by a series of letters in a collection that belonged to the Newdigate family. Somehow, this included a series of letters that Woodford wrote during his excavations at Agincourt. The Newdigate collection from which this comes from is uh, one of our biggest collections. Oh, right. The, the Newdigates would have known you know, a lot of families. They were quite an important family. And clearly, I think they were a family that were very interested in, in history and culture and art, right. which yes. may have explained their interest in this material. They probably would have been interested so, to, 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 to see the letters relating to Agincourt. Yes, certainly. So, so obviously, yes, these uh, before, before and after the time he's at Agincourt. He was quite prolific in writing to his brother, and yes. so uh, they were very close. Yes. So, of course, obviously, he was, uh, he's conveying the excitement of the finds Absolutely. Uh, to his brother, and he, he calls him my dear A, which is right. like he was a Alexander. <coughs> and so he was saying, you know, what he's been finding, etc., etc. So there's, there's his name, yeah. John George Woodford, yeah, to, to yeah. A, my dearest A. Yeah. Yeah. June the 19th. Yeah, so he's writing, he's ri writing to his brother the day after the battle. 400 years after Agincourt, in 1815, Lieutenant Colonel Woodford and his brother Major Alexander Woodford survived the greatest battle of their own times, Waterloo. If you survived the Battle of Waterloo, yeah, uh, yeah. one of the first things you do is you write home and tell well, your parents and your brother and yeah, everybody else yeah. that, uh, that you are OK. But it's the Agincourt letters from three years later in 1818 that Tim wants to see. They're the records of the only other excavation at the battlefield, describing the only known finds to have been made, including the gold ecu. So this is one of the Woodford letters. Yeah. This is the one that I'm quite interested in because the sketch of the coin here, and this was one of the coins that uh, George Woodford found during the excavations at Agincourt. So this gold coin that Woodford is describing here on the uh, February the 20th, 1818, this is while he's undertaking the excavations at Agincourt, and he's writing to his brother, and he's done a little, quite a nice little Very sketch. Very detailed sketch, it is. actually, yeah. And then this coin went on to have its own life and disappear into a, an archive of another stately home. Now, as far as I know, these two drawings are the only record of what uh, Woodford found in during his excavations. Mm. It's a primary document. It's yeah. an archaeological document mm. as well now because these sketches that tells you exactly the size, the I size assume, and shape. Yeah. And so this is all we now have of any of the information that's related to Woodford's excavations in 1818. Mm. And everything else, the exact description of how he found it, where he found it, it's all gone. It remains a mystery. <laughs> <So> yes. <laughs> so this is what I've been chasing, and this is mm. it's really nice to see this in the flesh, so yeah. to speak. Obviously, he's taken a lot of time over it. Mm. And he was very, obviously very proud of it because he says in Absolutely, the letter yeah. 
that uh, you won't believe my luck, I found several gold coins. Yeah. When these letters were, were, were honing in, were homing in on the, uh, on the detail that Woodford was providing. Yeah. I mean, he was making quite detailed notes and diaries and things. And that's what we do as archaeologists today. Woodford's dig at Agincourt caused controversy among some French locals for what they saw was the despoiling of the graves. The letters show, though, that his intention was always to give the bones a proper reburial. Now, the French say that uh, Woodford was ordered to leave by the Duke of Wellington, but we know that Wellington asks him quite politely, please, you know, you're making a f too much of a fuss, please leave the, the, the area. Rather frustratingly, there's no scale on this. No, it, it, and so he, re he says <laughs> he's a bit he, limiting, he, isn't it? I have ordered an oaken sarcophagus. Yeah for the bones. Yes. Now is that, is that this big or yes. is it a proper sarcophagus? Is it a coffin sized? One would suggest it's slightly larger. The word sarcophagus yeah. suggests a proper burial uh, container. Yeah. This has provided the design and the dimensions yes. elsewhere, hasn't it? I, and he's, he's he's not he's I have <coughs> cleared it with the mayor and curie to deposit them in Agincourt Church Yard. Mm -hmm. So he's even cleared it with the uh, with the church and yeah. said, right, basically, can I rebury them in the churchyard? And he's saying, and they're saying yes. So he's he's doing right by everybody mm. as much as he can do. And then we get to hear later from the French that this this box that Woodford has had ordered is then the bones are finally collected, put in this box, and then buried in the churchyard nice. in the correct place. So, but yeah. this isn't the general story that is available. The no. general story is he was a bit of a baddie. Yes, and uh, he was uh, he was uh, obviously slighting the French name and the mm. French couch and leaving it's bones spin here, put there, on and it, everywhere. It? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's pure French spin. Now we know because of this letter that it was it was Woodford that instigated this, right. and the French have always claimed that they did it. Right, he was going to have a stone memorial, a piece of marble made with a date, uh, fourteen fifteen on it. Uh, something very simply says so that it's not glorifying you know either side. Yes. Uh, just as a simple memorial, yes. and then he, sa he says all this, and he's writing to his brother, and his brother was very religious, right? So he's not going to lie to him blatantly. He no. might have no. embellished the truth a little bit, but basically he's telling him what he was planning to planning do. To do. Uh, so this is again, this is an important document because it gives one person's view, and obviously he's dead, and his opinion has been slurred, uh, you know, slighted, and yes. <laughs> almost you know distorted beyond recognition. Yeah. But having the primary document saying what his thoughts were to his own brother is fantastic, I think. Tim believes the letters aren't the only thing that Woodford may have left behind. There is an excavation diary that goes with this, right. explaining in great detail how he did the work at Agincourt, yeah. what he dug up, what he found, how he recorded it and where it all went to, yeah. including more annotated sketches. And of course that diary, the excavation diary, is, it's missing, unfortunately. Yeah. The diary that you're referring to isn't, isn't there, there because, because he would have kept that himself. He or the family has That's kept right. that. And so this is the, the <coughs> detective side of the story and it's unravelling the truth. Mm. And this is why I like it because I like the facts. As an archaeologist, mm. I like looking at the facts. And the facts are he's got, done a nice little drawing. He's got the, uh, the drawing of the coin, the mm. arrowhead. Mm. He's trying to make good what he's doing by recording it. And that's, as archaeologists, that, that's all we do today. We take yeah. photographs, record it. And, uh, and because we're, we're destroying the primary evidence. Mm. So seeing the primary evidence from 1818 is fascinating, but it still doesn't get us any closer to where, <laughs> to where this diary is. Tim then finds a clue as to what could have happened to the missing diary, relating to when the items from the collection were placed in storage in London. Somebody's made a note, and this is much later, yes. and it says, Sir John Woodford, re digging field of Agincourt, all he found lost in the burning of the Pantechnican. The Pantechnican was the original storage house. That's where we get the name Pantechnican van from. Pantechnican. And that was the name of the Pantechnican was um, the original storage house in London. And apparently it all burnt down. And it was like a, a bazaar. It was uh, not only a storage place, but obviously like people bought and sold. It's like an antiques trading sort of place right. almost. And this may, starts to make sense now, but somebody's actually qualified this and why they put it on here I don't know because these letters survive yeah. one of the gold coins survives so everything wasn't lost no clearly not so whenever the archive went into the Pantechnican it must have already been 
uh, separated. Yeah. Well, this material was sent to his brother, wasn't yes. it? So this may have been separate That's from right. the other. And, but material. the coin survived as well. Yeah. So that wasn't sent to the bank technically no. either. So there, <coughs> there are things that survived. So did the diary? Did the diary get burnt well. in the Pantechnicon then? Mm. No. But oh, well, that would explain it its would, absence. It would, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so it might not exist anymore, um, along with many of the other artefacts. So maybe that's a simple explanation about where everything's gone to, mm -hmm. including the reference to the gold rings. Yeah. Uh, that's terrible. So maybe it's gone forever. Woodford's diary may be missing, but he did also produce a sketch map of the battlefield. It's very accurate to the roads and terrain, displaying all his skill as a former staff officer to the Duke of Wellington. Woodford plotted the French and English armies, but where did he find his information on their dispositions? It prompts Tim to check out all the known references that Woodford could have used. Anne Curry may be able to help clear up some of the confusion surrounding what we know or think we know about Agincourt. The earliest map Tim can find that shows Agincourt battlefield is the Cassini map from the 18th century, almost 400 years after the battle. Right from the start, there are problems with this. What we need to look at are the original sources of the map, the, the cartographic evidence, because of course we've got 400 years where there are no yeah, maps whatsoever. In which case, if we look at the first map, and obviously that's the Cassini map from the mid 18th mm -hmm. century, yeah. The only representation of the battle on that is as one of the sword symbols. The Cassini map only refers to the approximate location of the battlefield. Through her research, Anne could find no diagram or plan of the actual engagement itself until well into the 19th century. Well, this, I believe, is the first printed attempt to plan the battle. And this was in Harris Nicholas's History of the Battle of Agincourt, the second edition of 1832. It's a bit problematic because it seems to be the wrong way round. It seems to put Agincourt on the right-hand side. The battle is shown on the west of the village of Agincourt. So is this wrong? Well, nobody else has ever followed it up, have No, they? it does Well, although there are elements of this in other maps. All the later maps from the mid-19th century almost to the present day seem to have used this as their inspiration before adding their own individual details. A lot of these are artistic representations of what people are thinking about at the time. But there are very few maps that show it like that. I mean, the tradition as it developed in the 19th century shows it in the traditional positions with the woods, Agincourt to the, the west, Tramcourt to the east. If all the later maps follow Harris Nichols' 1832 map, then where did Harris Nichols get his information? Only one detailed battle map is known to have existed before 1832. Well, this is the earliest map that we know of, and it's also one of the most accurate. And this is the one that was drawn by Woodford in 1818. Woodford has superimposed his interpretation of the battle in this, on this map. And of course, what we have is now the standard format of what we would recognise as the Battle of Agincourt. We don't know whether that influenced, say, Nicholas's diagram exactly, in yeah, that's uh, 1832. The only problem from the study of Agincourt point of view is that all of the things Woodford has marked on here are in his own mind. They're <laughs> no more reliable than the chronicle texts. Exactly. Woodford probably based his own interpretation on the texts that were available to him at the time in the early 19th century. Many of the chronicles that are now standard references for Agincourt weren't translated until Anne's work in the 1990s. The chronicles of Raphael Hollinshead were in most gentlemen's libraries, so uh, I think that's, that's where he got the information from. So it's not until we find the physical evidence of, of this battle 
so with numbers of arrowheads, numbers of artifacts, numbers of whatever it is, even numbers of bodies from bones, in a specific place can we target this area and say, right, this is part of the battlefield? And know that it is. Until then, to be honest, Agincourt only exists in our minds, really, from reading this and yes, from looking at these maps. It, it's still an interpretation, and mm. an interpretation only exists in the mind until you find something to, so. to tie it to. Yeah. It will never be known exactly how many French soldiers died. Most of them probably still lie in the fields near here, somewhere. The mass of French infantry made a perfect target. Hundreds, thousands of English archers bent their backs and loosed their bows, unleashing an arrow storm. Henry V knew full well that the longbow in the hands of trained English archers was the weapon to be most feared in the battlefields of the Hundred Years' War. He would have known the effectiveness of arrow, uh, an arrow storm or a use of arrows in a punctuated fashion as well, and he was wounded in the face by an arrow at the Battle of Shrewsbury. The English king was unlikely to have forgotten the painful experience of having the arrow removed over several days. I think it's realised just how useful those troops are because they're terribly versatile. We're seeing them at Agincourt in a perfect situation for the arrow storm, but they have many other uses uh, also. As I say, they have a use in the melee too. With their last arrows loosed, the English archers would have joined the men-at-arms in the final pell-mell assault on the beleaguered French. Back in France, Tim now goes in search of a few of them. There's one last place he wants to look. Tim knows Woodford found some of the Agincourt dead, but exactly how many is unknown, until the excavation diary is perhaps one day rediscovered. Yet what happened to the bones Woodford found? In the years after the dig, there were French claims that Woodford planned to use them to celebrate an English triumph at Agincourt. Tim's research has shown that this was not the case. What we need to do is we need to find this date inscribed on the wall of the church. It's 1838. This marks the location, according to a certain document, of where the human remains were buried in the churchyard that Woodford excavated from the, from the mass graves. It's potentially the end of a long line of investigations. It, we've been tracking Woodford, we've been tracking his excavations, we've been attempting to find out where his excavations took place. And then of course these are the human remains that were found in the grave. And then they were transposed from the battlefield, transposed down onto the village, into the churchyard. I've never looked for this date and I've never looked at the piece of ground. We'll go to the, the chapel and we'll see if we can find this date somewhere on the wall of the church. John George Woodford who in his 90s was the last British officer who'd served at Waterloo to die, perhaps knew something of what it meant to have experienced the most terrible battle of an era. He intended to rebury the bones with simple dignity. Tim Sutherland is the only other archaeologist to have searched for the Agincourt graves. So almost 200 years on, it's fitting that he's here now to look for the last piece of the puzzle. It's closely associated with a window, so it should be easy enough to find, but it's not there. It's not not on that one. I presume it was some, they were, they were marking the wall to make some sort of recognition and so they could recognise the spot again. And here's a blocked up and there it is. There's the 18, 38. That's the spot, according to the story, that's the place where the human remains were buried and it's not it's not a large area so and it's also part of the path going through past this window so presumably it's a small 
amount of human remains. It's not going to be a huge casket. So um, it's interesting. And maybe they're still there. I presume they are still there. So after all that wait in the grave until 1818, and then they come out of the grave and they're collected together and finally make their way into consecrated ground in this churchyard in the village of Agincourt. And they never quite made it into the specially built memorial chapel to the battle. It's quite sad in a way. But at least we found it. I think that's important.